Hello, I'm Atuba George, and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, before we go into today's broadcast, are you ready to make demand for your daily bread? Are you, are you really ready? Praise God. What are you expecting today? Because if you make demand without expectation, it will be counterproductive because even when God gives you, you won't even recognize it. So first of all, have an expectation in your heart. And then you release your faith. Praise God. So are you ready? What daily bread do you want? Say with me, Father, I demand right now for my daily bread. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. It's coming to me now in Jesus' name. Amen. I see someone, you are supposed to pay for an exam. Yes, you're supposed to pay for an exam. And I, that exam is going to cost you about 150 something thousand, 53,000 or thereabouts. And you're so worried about it. Hear the word of the Lord to you. You would write that exam. Fear not. The Lord will supply that money to you. And you will write that exam. Praise God. While, while we're asking for our daily bread, the Lord just showed me that vision. You, you're supposed to pay for this exam. And the cost of the exam is about 150 something um, thousand. I think I'm saying three uh, there about. Praise God. So thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord is supplying that money to you. Praise God. Hallelujah. So receive it in thanksgiving. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. All right, then. Now, I remember I was sharing something to you. Now, our text, we're talking about covenants, the covenants. And so our text is from Second First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 15, where it says, remember his covenants. Put it in your mind. I remember I was sharing something to you, uh, with you yesterday. And, and I was talking about grace, you know, not just grace now. When you take up one aspect, see, so when 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 Paul said something, said, I declared unto you the whole counsel of God. Now, even that statement is kind of related because <clears throat> for for two reasons. Number one, we do not even have all of Paul's writings. There's something I will tell you that will really surprise you. All the writings we have in the New Testament were not all of Paul's writings. This may surprise you. The main writings of Paul, we don't even have them. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Is there other writings? The, the, the real thoughts See, let me put it this way. Paul's real notes. You remember he, he had instructed Timothy to bring his parchments. Okay? Now, what do you think were in those parchments? Now, they contain his personal. Now, he was a, a learned person. Paul, of course, Paul was a learned person. Okay? So, he loved to read. He loved to, to write. So, there are lots of notes that Paul had taken in his own study. We don't have them. So what we have are thoughts that he communicated to specific people. Those are not all of his thoughts. Now those were, it's like today I'm, I'm writing to someone. Now my writing to that person will have everything to do with my relationship with that person and the understanding that I have with that person. See? So I may have a kind of relationship with um, person A, and then I have a different kind of relationship with person B. So if I'm writing to both of them, the kind of things we'll discuss will not be the same. See, it will not be the same. Now, this is where I, I urge believers to pay more attention to the Holy Spirit and not men. Not even men. Of the Bible, see, that's not what I'm talking about. We learn from them, but they are not our standard. 
Jesus made a statement. He said, I have a lot to share with you, but you cannot bear them. This is Jesus physically talking to his disciples. Don't you grab his leg and say, no, Jesus, share, share. We want to hear from you. Who else can teach us? But Jesus said, but when the Holy Spirit comes, that's to tell you that there are lots of things the Holy Spirit is going to teach you that Jesus did not even teach you. Because Jesus said, I can't teach you certain things. Why? Because you can't bear them now. So, there are levels, there are layers and layers of knowledge that you may need to add before you can bear those things. And then, who now is going to teach you those things? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what he said? You know, that's why I was talking to you, uh, um, I think two days ago. So I said, listen, it's an error to judge everything you want to express with the Bible. You will end in error. And the Bible is important. It gives lots and lots of confirmations. But you see, why I say you will get into error is because your understanding will get to a place where, sincerely speaking, I said your understanding, I didn't say your knowledge. Because the more you know, the more understanding you get. Okay? The more you mature, the more understanding you get. So, as you mature in knowledge, this is the reason people grow, people who, were, who love the word of God, who love the things of church, they grow to an extent in life. They begin to put the Bible aside. Why? Because they feel the Bible does not address certain things that they are facing in life today. Meanwhile, it does. But what they don't get is their understanding is where the problem is. So you take up one part and you feel you've understood it. So people who believe in grace now standing yesterday. You know, when this whole grace thing started years ago, and I said to something, I said, this is going to cause a big problem. And when I say it's going to cause a big problem, this is exactly what I meant. They, are, they the proponent, the, the people who are pushing this gospel of grace, they will get to a point where they will begin to ignore the word of God. In order to push this grace agenda, they will begin to ignore the word of God. And Jesus made a very, very powerful statement. The scriptures cannot be broken. You see, when you hear something like that, the scriptures cannot be broken. Now, when Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken, what does he say? The word of God cannot be broken. Okay? So that's one principle of understanding we must carry in our minds, that the word of God cannot be broken. So much so that Jesus even said that if anyone breaks one of the least of these commandments. Now, what he actually said there was anyone who breaks down of the least of the word of God. Jesus said that person and teach men so. That person will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So number one, what does he do? He breaks the word of God. What does it mean to break the word of God? To discard it. To make it relevant. And then you don't stop there. You now teach men to do it. You know, there are things Jesus said sometimes you ignore. until so when you grow up, you look at it again and say, Ha! <laughs> and sometimes, because people have dwelt so much in error, it's so difficult for them to repent. Because where do I start from? That's the question. Hey, start from the beginning. It's never too late. So now you teach men. You didn't only break it. You teach men so. 
And Jesus said, you'll be called what? Least in the kingdom of heaven. If you understand that statement, you, you, you'll be careful how you handle the things of the Spirit. You'll be very careful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So, the risk I was talking about in, in, in people who push this grace movement, I said they'll get to the point where they'll begin to discard the word of God. Why? Because the word of God will not fit in to their narrative. So when they got to that point where they begin to teach that Titan is not necessary, I expected it. I knew it was coming to that. How? Because they would think, now, these things happened in, not just today. These things happened in scriptures, in the days of the scriptures. I've shared that. I think I've shared that with you. When, when we talk about issues, for example, like circumcision. So, now, the, when, when the gospel began to go out to the Gentiles, and they were preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and some people showed up. Now, you see, some people showed up and they began to say, hey, except you are circumcised, uh, you cannot be saved. Now you see, that became a problem. Why was it a problem? The people who brought that thought, who brought that message, they now, you, you can't tell how genuine their heart was. Because, you see, naturally, Jewish people are proud people. And then when I say proud people, they feel on top of the world. They feel they are the special breed of God. See? So now, hearing that the Gentiles are getting saved by their numbers can become a problem to the Jewish mind. Not to the godly mind, to the Jewish mind. So someone looks at it and said, no, no, they can't, they can't have it all like that. Okay, I think they, there's something they are missing. We are not the same. So, so how are you not the same? We are circumcised. They are not. Ah! Yeah. So let's push that message. If you are not circumcised, you cannot be saved. You've got to be circumcised before you are saved. So, they began to examine. Where are they examining it from? Not from the word of God, from what those people are saying. See where error comes in. And see where people are misdirected into error. Please understand what I'm sharing with you. Because some of you, it's taking years to understand what I'm saying to you right now. So can you just calm down and listen? So they now begin to fight what these people are saying. For two reasons. One, they feel they understand their intentions, that they are wrong. Second reason is they don't want anybody to put obstacle in the work that they are doing. These two reasons doesn't make full reference to the word of God. So you see, it's like mathematics. Okay. If you don't understand the question, first of all, and you use the wrong formula to solve the question that you did not understand. Your solvings will be right. Your answer to what you solved will be right. But the whole thing you just did was wrong. And that's what happens to a lot of people. So, I remember I had that issue with my son recently. You know, he, I, I was reviewing his homework. And I looked at what he did, numeracy, I would say. I looked at what he solved. Okay, 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 okay. I'm like, you're right. I'm like, this is right. And then my wife said, look at the question carefully. I said, oh, okay. So I looked at the question. I read that question like two times. In fact, the first time I read the question, I'm like, yeah. Then I, I, I pause, I like, hold on. 
I looked at that question again. And I said, no, Jota, what you saw was not what they were asking for. This is what they were. And then I had to explain the question for him again. And he said, oh. And he had to clean, up, clean what he had done. And then, re now, his, his calculations were right. Now, you get what I'm saying. He, he, he chose a, a, a pattern to solve that question. And then he solved what he solved right. From what he solved, this answer was right. But you see, the problem would have been when the, you send it to the teacher. The teacher has the marking scheme with the answers that I'm so. So the, answer, the teacher will look at her, her answer and like, no, this, this is wrong. Then you want to now go, no, how can you say it's wrong? Look, this plus this. Then the teacher says, no, this is not the. You understand what I'm saying? So that's the same thing we have with a lot of people. You choose the wrong fight and, and begin to fight that fight. Your, uh, your, your points may be right according to the fight that you're fighting. But the problem now is you're fighting the wrong fight in the first place. So everything you've done or you're doing in that your fight is wrong. It's like, so, so now I was talking about the circumcision thing. So these people, the, the apostles who were preaching to the Gentiles, just felt these people are wrong. Why? Because they understood that their, their, their intentions were wrong. They were raising certain points, but their intentions were wrong. And so they now went to Jerusalem and said, see, we have a problem. There are these folks who are just coming to spoil the work we are doing. And that's how they consider it. Saying that the, the Gentiles must be circumcised. Now, and then they added something else, that the Gentiles must be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. So when they got to that conference, they all began to argue. Like I keep saying, in all that argument, they did not pray. They didn't tell us they prayed. They didn't tell us they prayed. They argued, yes. And from their arguments, the people who presented the stronger points won the day. And those are the people who are saying, we don't think it is necessary to be circumcised. Okay. Now, why do they say it's not necessary to be circumcised? Here's their testimony. Peter went to preach to the Gentiles. And while he was preaching, they were not circumcised. The Holy Ghost came on them like it came on us. And they all began to speak in other tongues. Paul has been preaching among the Gentiles and he's seen the mighty hand of God. They didn't need to be circumcised before all that happened. You see, so they felt if, if the Holy Ghost can come on people who are not circumcised, then why do we need to bother them with circumcision and keeping the laws of Moses? Yeah. The Bible says, better is the end of the matter than the beginning thereof. See? The Spirit of God can come on a prostitute and she begins to prophesy. Yeah. And then someone looks at it and is like, huh? the Holy Ghost came on this girl on the street while she was waiting for a customer. I don't think the Holy Spirit is against the prostitutes. And someone now drives you like, maybe that's one way to make money. So the Holy Ghost does not approve of it. Why would he come on her? I said, better is the end of the thing than the beginning. Jesus gave a parable. A man invited some specific people for a dinner. They refused to come. But dinner was set. So the man sent out his servant, go to the streets, anybody you see, bring them in. That was the beginning. So a lot of people came in to enjoy this dinner. But the, Jesus in that parable said, the, 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 the house owner went around his guest and saw one without a wedding garment. 
And you know the story. It's a cast into outer darkness. Excuse me, sir. You invited everybody from the street. Why were you expecting them all to have wedding garments? Now, I know some people, because you see, that's the trick you talk about. Some people now want to, like, no, you know, because, it, it, hey, no, you invited people from the street. You are supposed to know that some of them will not have wedding garments to wear. They were invited from the street. They were anybody's. But he treated that one. I said, better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Don't judge from the beginning. Try to look at the end. So the fact that the Holy Ghost came on a prostitute doesn't mean the Holy Ghost endorses prostitution. The fact that the Holy Ghost came on them, even though they were not circumcised, is not enough to say circumcision is unnecessary. I'm just trying to get your minds thinking. You must have more valid points. You must find out if God actually cancels circumcision. My time is up. Father, knowledge is coming to your church. Knowledge is coming to your children. Fill our hearts with your truth that we may walk perfectly, Lord, with you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye.